This is Sarah Wilkinson from Humber College and the University of Guelph Humber. In this next video in my nervous system series, I'm going to talk about action potentials. You're going to want to make sure you're familiar with electrochemical gradients and neuron anatomy before continuing with this video. As you will recall from the electrochemical gradient video, communication in the nervous system is absolutely dependent on changes in membrane potential. And to define what membrane potential is, it's the voltage resulting from separation of negative and positively charged ions across the membrane. On the inside of the membrane, there's more negatively charged proteins, while on the outside there's very little protein, but an abundance of sodium. So this schematic shows you the distribution of ions and protein. Outside the cell, an abundance of sodium. Inside the cell, a higher concentration of potassium. And the large negatively charged proteins are in higher concentration inside the cell. So to summarize, outside the cell, there's a higher concentration of sodium and chloride and inside the cell, a higher concentration of potassium protein. Inside the cell has a resting membrane potential of about minus 70 millivolts. Action potentials occur when the membrane potential rapidly rises and falls, and this occurs due to a movement of sodium and potassium ions. So I'm going to illustrate here a resting membrane potential of minus 70 millivolts. As ions channels open and close, you'll see a rapid rise in membrane potential followed by a rapid fall. That's what we call an action potential. I'll show you again. Rise and then fall. We're going to go through the series of events that lead to sodium moving in, potassium moving out, and then returning to resting membrane conditions. So let's blow up our neuron. As you can recall, this is the axon. Let's blow up a section of this axon. For illustration purposes, I'm going to denote the side of the axon walls with lines, and I'm going to remove the myelin sheath for now. So here we go. Here is the walls of the axon. In here we've got the cytosol which has a higher concentration of potassium. And then outside the cell in the extracellular fluid we have a higher concentration of sodium. Inside the cell we have a negative resting membrane potential due mostly to the large proteins. Let's now just look at the sodium. These brown shapes here are going to denote sodium channels. In response to a stimulus, sodium channels will open up. Now, sodium can move from an area of high concentration down its concentration gradient to an area of low concentration. Normally, the plasma membrane is impermeable to sodium. So sodium will move down its concentration gradient into the cell. What this will do will cause what's called a depolarization. So that inside the cell now is more positively charged than outside because lots of sodium has rushed in. This occurs in just a small area where the sodium channel is opened up. So you can see here, here we've got a positive membrane potential, but right adjacent, a negative membrane potential. What this is going to do is going to attract the sodium ions, which are in higher concentration on the left-hand side and lower concentration on the right-hand side, to move down their electrochemical gradient, where it's positively charged to negatively charged. This movement of sodium ions will cause voltage-gated sodium channels to open up and more sodium will rush down 
its gradient. This results in a positive membrane potential. This continues on down the axon, opening channels, sodium moving in, and so on and so forth. So it's like a chain reaction. We can think of this wave of depolarization like dominoes. When one part of the axon depolarizes, it triggers the rest of the axon to depolarize. So as you can see here, we've got depolarization in one part, leading to depolarization in another part, and so on and so forth. As one area becomes depolarized, the other area will start to be call, become repolarized in that sodium channels close and potassium channels will open up. So we've got a wave of depolarization followed by a wave of repolarization. This occurs so that another action potential could occur very soon after the first one goes. So one can go immediately followed by another action potential. Let's illustrate now how this repolarization occurs. The repolarization is going to involve potassium and potassium channels. So let's go through our steps so far. A stimulus signals sodium channels to open up. Sodium moves down its electrochemical gradient. Once it's done that, potassium channels will open up and potassium will move out its electrochemical gradient, restoring membrane potential. Now we have a bit of a problem here in that we normally have higher concentrations of sodium outside than inside and higher concentration of potassium inside than outside, and we've got the complete opposite. What's going to happen is that these sodium-potassium channels are going to close, and the sodium-potassium exchange pump is going to pump sodium out of the cell against its concentration gradient, and potassium into the cell against its concentration gradient. So what the sodium potassium pump is doing is returning the resting membrane potential. So here you can see, using ATP, it's going to pump the ions against their gradient, returning to normal resting conditions. So as you can recall, to continue good communication, we have to restore resting membrane conditions. Let's review all the steps in the action potential. To start off with, the resting membrane potential is negative. That means there's more negative charges inside the cell than out, and it's around minus 70 millivolts. A stimulus causes sodium channels to open up. When sodium moves down into the neuron, this is going to render the inside positive, and we call this depolarization. So as sodium moves in, the inside of the neuron becomes positive and we call this wave depolarization. Once depolarization has occurred, sodium channels are going to close. At the same time, potassium channels open up. What this is going to do is that potassium is going to move out of the neuron, rendering the inside negative again and we call this repolarization. So this return of the membrane to potential to a negative value is called repolarization. The potassium channels stay open a bit longer, causing hyperpolarization, making the membrane potential more negative than resting, because a little bit extra potassium leaves. Once the potassium channels close, the sodium-potassium pump can restore ion concentrations to resting conditions and return the membrane potential back to minus 70 millivolts so that another action potential can occur. So if we look here, 
we're going to see a wave of depolarization followed by repolarization. When another stimulus occurs, the same thing's going to happen again. So up till now, I've talked about a generalized stimulus. So what could be the possible stimuli to cause those sodium channels to open up? There are three types of channels. Channels that are chemically gated, that are signaled by binding of things like neurotransmitters or oxygen, and they're going to open in response to the appropriate chemical. We've talked about voltage-gated channels, channels down the axon that open and close in response to changes in membrane potential, so going more negative or more positive. And finally, we're going to have channels that respond to mechanical stimulus. So for example, in your fingers, you're going to have channels there that respond to physical deformation. That's going to initiate the action potential. So to sum up, action potentials are due to changes in ion concentration across the cell, and they're responsible for neuron communication. In the next video, I'm going to talk about how two neurons, or a neuron and a tissue, communicate.